Welcome, I'm Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, Thus Says the Lord, God Speaks Through His Servants, the Prophets. Today we'll be talking about Lesson 6 of our study, which covers the first book of Kings, chapter 15, verse 25, through chapter 17, verse 24. So, we took a brief divergence at the end of the last lesson to talk a little bit about what's going on in Judah. Now we're going to once again shift back uh, and look at what's going on in Israel. Um, as we're doing that, we're setting up a pattern here of sort of how we're going to progress through the books of Kings. Uh, to keep things roughly chronological, we're going to sort of leap frog back and forth, uh, one house at a time through one ring, maybe two, and the, some of these are very short, as we'll see and we've talked about. Um, and then when we get a little ways with one, we're going to jump over and see what they were up to on the other side, uh, and then jump back and back. Uh, and so this is not at all going to be an uncommon pattern, um, and here we get to see some of it. So Israel if you remember, is doing awesome because they're so pious. Oh, no, that's not Israel or Judah. Uh, but Judah's doing better. Israel has had this problem with their king named Jeroboam, uh, and he has not done so well, and it's set them up for failure. Uh, it is not always true that a king or a boss manager, whatever, uh, is the cause of all problems that people encounter and face, but it is true that such people can either set the people that they're responsible up for success or for failure. Uh, and Jeroboam set up the people of Israel in a way that would make it very hard for them to be pleasing to God. Uh, by, as we talked about, he changed the religious practices, uh, he redefined everything in a very Israel-centric way, Northern Kingdom-centric way, which cut off the worship of the North and the Temple, or of the South and the Temple, uh, and generally is just really not done so hot. Uh, after God promised that if he did well, uh, he could have an everlasting dynasty like David does. So we know that's not happening, and we know God is pissed. Uh, he sent a prophet to say, yeah, buddy, that's not okay, and bad things are going to happen to you. Uh, so now, after talking about what's going on in the north, we get to talk about what those are. So, Jeroboam dies, uh, and his son takes over the throne after him, uh, and we see... Typically, also when we see these kings, uh, when you see someone who has a very short reign, uh, it is typically an indicator that bad things have been going on either in their immediate ancestry or that they themselves also were not doing so well. Um, I won't necessarily say that's 100% true, but it's a pretty good guess. Um, and in this case, obviously, Jeroboam's son, it's definitely true. Uh, God has already said, we don't like you. Uh, so he does become king for a little while, uh, and then uh, there's no, there's really no comment even about his kingship other than he followed the ways of his father uh, and did evil. Uh, and that's going to be how we refer to a lot of these kings of Israel. He followed in the ways of Jeroboam. At least this one had the excuse that he was Jeroboam's son. Uh, he's not getting it done. God. Uh, has decided and already said we don't need this dynasty anymore so somebody else from outside of the family takes over. Uh, again that's the thing we will see in the north and not in the south. In the south we have a dynasty that God has committed to and is protecting. We will not see uh, military coups or people changing who they want to serve and follow. We will not see a change in dynasty and line in the south, uh, per God's promise to David. Uh, so the biggest drama, there will be some drama about the succession down south as well, uh, but it will never be, we're going to throw out the whole line and find somebody from a different tribe, which happens in the third generation up north. Uh, not even because he only gets two years and he gets killed, it basically happens in the second generation. Uh, that. 
uh, Jeroboam's son gets thrown out by means of being killed to make sure that there is never another claim that that was the dynasty uh, and any struggles for who should be the legitimate heir uh, as often has happened in history when there is a coup that overthrows an existing dynasty. If you want to solidify your position, your best bet is to murder everyone in the family of the previous dynasty, which is what God said was going to happen, and it is in fact what happens. So we've got Beasha uh, is the name of this king. It is not one that is incredibly important to remember, as we'll see, but he does uh, at least do the God-sanctioned work of killing Jeroboam and his whole family, which makes him at least a step better than Jeroboam. Uh, so, we have changed not only kings, but dynasties, which the first time it happens here is very significant. As it becomes a pattern in the north, uh, it becomes just, oh, yawn, they're changing dynasties again. Uh, and it's not, it's just the norm. But for now, since God had appointed Jeroboam and had given him the possibility to have a dynasty like there is in the south, it is a big deal when we see that not happen. In the, late, in the future, eh, not such a big deal. Uh, we're also not deluding ourselves from the text or from context or from how we think about this that Baasha has the same possibility here to have an everlasting, eternal, God-sanctioned dynasty. His biggest role from God's point of view is the murder of Jeroboam's whole life, uh, which he executes very well, uh, pun intended. Uh, so the other thing that we should keep in mind here uh, is that how are, we should always keep in mind through changing dynasties uh, and kings and rulers, what does the relationship look like between North and South? Uh, because that'll kind of ebb and flow as well a little bit. It's been not good here, new dynasty in the north, we see still not good. Uh, they are, there is conflict between north and south. Uh, and so that kind of gets us set up for where we're at. Uh, and we can keep looking at what's going on. So, Beersha's king. Uh, and these very few verses here are all the time we really need to give it after he wiped out the house of Jeroboam. Uh, it's worth keeping in mind from a political point of view here uh, that, again, as we talked about with Jeroboam, there is incentive in the north for the kings to keep this up. Uh, if they were to say, if somebody were to come in and say, yeah, we should actually worship in the south, uh, and we should be chummy with them, uh, and go to Jerusalem three times a year, uh, and make Jerusalem the center of our worship, there is still very much the danger that everyone could say, you know, we really like Jerusalem, and why did we split again? And David, they have a, a kingly dynasty stretching back to David, and you're our king from a military coup that you just recently pulled off. Uh, and that seems way more legitimate to us, and we like what they're selling. Uh, again, so it's not necessarily that Beosha and all these kings are inherently setting out to, what can I do to be the most evil person that I could possibly be? Uh, although it does it can come across that way and it can end up that way. It's more of a case of when we make these sacrifices of convenience, of I only understand how this can work if I do it this way, uh, which was again part of Jeroboam's thing. I know God has, made, has said he loves me and the good things will come to me from these things, but I only understand how that can work if I do it this way. Uh, and so I like and appreciate what God wants to give me and I want to, yeah, let's get that. Uh, and so I'll, but he must have meant for me to have to do it by making these compromises because I don't understand how else it can happen. Uh, is there is an inherent lack of faith in that, uh, which is a struggle for us all. And it's a thing that still persists. Uh, 
Example, I feel called to marriage. A number of young people do. Uh, it's very tempting to, from that, make compromises in how we approach our dating lives, uh, especially with, with pressure from the society around us, and say, cool, so God has told me what he wants, so I'm going to go get it any other way I want to, and then we'll come back and we'll figure out where God fits in. Or, yeah, I know God, I feel like God is wanting me to vocationally pursue this line of work. I know here's a job at a company that does things that I don't agree with or believe in, but I feel called to do this kind of thing, so I should go do that and God will make it up on the back end, is not really how that works. Um, and where, then that is really the substance of faith, is being able to trust that God has a plan and that we can get to where God wants us to go while doing things the way God wants us to do them. Um, and it's an absolute relinquishing of control, or the feeling thereof. It's not that we truly have control even when we think we do, but it's a relinquishing of that feeling of, I am in control of this situation, and I trust God will make this okay. And the kings in the north are not doing that. Uh, they are here saying, yeah, God set this up, but we don't see how this works unless we do it this way. Um, so yeah, they're bad guys, and that compromise can lead to very bad places uh, by inches, right? A little compromise, and then a little compromise, and you're in a bad, bad place the next thing you know. Um, and you never meant to get there. Um, and whether you ever meant to be a terrible, evil person or not, maybe you are. Uh, at the end of some of the roads uh, that compromise can lead us down. Uh, and so we should not just say, Beishai, yeah, terrible guy. Uh, he loved murdering his predecessor's family and leading the people of Israel to sin. Uh, that is basically what this reads like, is a magazine article. His interests were uh, killing the family of his predecessors and leading the people to sin. Uh, but he certainly is a more three-dimensional person than that. And we can see how all of those things could be justified by the sense of necessity. If he's going to, he maybe even took kingship thinking he would be a better king than Jeroboam's family. It would not be that hard. Uh, so he even could have been well-intentioned, although he could have also just been seeking power. Uh, but it's easy to make some of these bad characters very two-dimensional uh, and to separate themselves from us, right? So this is me, I'm a good guy, and I would never do that, and they're bad. Uh, and that's not really the message here. Uh, as we talk about how the kingdom splits and compare and contrast it and look at it, the message for us in our lives is to see ourselves on both sides of this, to see where it is we can split and diverge and where it is we can try to follow along the path better. And in, on the side of Judah, we can see a different set of struggles and failings as well. Uh, and on both sides of this, there's a call to us to look at how we can go wrong uh, and what God is asking of us on what going right looks like. Uh, and here in this case, we see a prophet is sent uh, to the king to say, hey buddy, you're not getting it done. Uh, you're acting like the guy we had removed. Uh, so since this is a Bible study about the prophets, we should mention, and while briefly on that as well, on we've talked quite a bit about the role of a prophet. Uh, right now, we see the prophets coming to the kings of the northern kingdom uh, and acting as still a check. They're still, although there's this is less hey, why don't you repent, and more, hey, you're dead, as well. Uh, again, we've talked about the message can easily be summed up as either, please repent, or too late, you're dead. Uh, and this is more of the too late, you're dead flavor. But it's still God interacting with the kings through the prophets. Uh, God is taking a direct hand. Uh, he's not just killing him. He's making sure everyone knows why, via the voice of a prophet. Uh, and that should call us also to reflect a little bit on, is this prophet really just for the king? 
uh, if the message gets out and everyone knows that God is overthrowing the king because of what he's done, I think we can see in that as well a call for the people, saying, if I can depose the king because he's not doing well, unswitch that. The people, the call of the death of the king for the people is one of repentance. Is still, you all still have time to get your act right. Too late for this guy uh, and his whole line. Uh, because we're going to be switching those a lot now. But for all of you people in the Northern Kingdom, it is not too late. Please repent uh, while you still have time. Uh, and so, kind of twofold message there. Uh, we end up with King really not getting it done, going to go away. So, we've been talking about King Baasha. We basically could just hit copy and paste here and find and replace a couple of names and it's what we just saw. Uh, again, we saw the prophet Jehu who came and said, hey, you're not getting it done. I'm going to do to your line what I did to Jeroboam's line. And then he does. He comes in, wipes them out. Uh, again, a military coup in this case, but it's again people rising up against him and deciding we don't need this guy or his line as our king. We're going to get rid of all of that. Uh, this is, it's almost comical how quickly it comes right at, like one right after the other, but again it shows the instability, the dynastic instability we have in the north. Uh, and if you think about it, that has to also be having some effect on the people. Uh, if you keep changing not only kings but lines, Right? If it's a father to a son to a son to a son to a son, there's probably at least relatively consistent policy. Um, here the only policy that seems consistent that we know about for sure is we're going to kill all of our predecessors, we don't like the South, uh, and whatever else is involved in sinning egregiously against the Lord, let's keep doing that. Uh, but it would lead to a significant amount of instability uh, for the people and geopolitical instability in terms of how the north relates to the region. Uh, if King Baishah gets a good relationship with, let's say, Egypt, and then he's murdered, then your kingdom has to start over in that political relationship. Uh, it's not like you have an office full of, an office of state uh, full of ambassadors and a, and a whole years and years of history, especially the North, which has relatively recently succeeded, does not have seceded, uh, has not uh, had long history of relationships with any of these surrounding kingdoms, leaving them just extremely destabilized by all of this. Uh, the people, their relationships with everyone around them, everything is, it is a mess. So when you think about it, also think about how big of a mess the situation must be and what, what would it be like to live there. Uh, at any rate, uh, more kings are dying, more lines are ending, uh, business as usual in the north. We saw Baasha come to be king through, it was unclear, but some sort of rebellion involving killing the king. Uh, we see specifically a military coup uh, of a military leader overthrowing the king here with Zimri. Um, so he's set up, he's ready to be king, uh, he's got nice seven day reign, uh, and then he also is dead in another military coup. Uh, just again highlighting rampant and radical instability. Uh, and when there's no clearly established dynasty, everybody's going to think they can seize power and it looks like if they can get enough support, especially from the army, that ends up actually being true. Uh, strange thing here is the reason cited again uh, for the end of his seven day reign is that he too led the people to sin like Jeroboam did. Uh, you really wonder how much could he have gotten up to in seven days and how much sinning could he have done. Uh, but you would have time in those seven days to reaffirm, I want to keep doing things the way we've been doing them uh, regarding the South. 
Uh, and yeah, those high places are great. Uh, we should keep them or even make more. Or at this point, again, and this, this is the thing we should think about as well as we reflect on our lives, at this point, not changing the sin is as bad almost as doing it. Uh, it's being complicit in the situation Jeroboam has created is bad enough to be likened to Jeroboam, whether any of these people themselves would have set it up that way or not. By not changing it, they become responsible for it as king. Uh, whether that be you didn't change it for 30 years or two years or seven days, uh, if you are king, you are responsible for those things, those structures that are in place and what they're doing to the people. So really, yes, he did sin in the manner of Jeroboam and lead the people to sin. Uh, clearly, by not having the intention to do anything about that, he is as culpable as anyone who had longer to do it. Uh, and so he sees there's less emphasis. You don't really need to kill the whole family and every living ancestor of someone who was king for seven days in a military coup. He didn't have time to establish himself as really legitimate at all, but he definitely has to go. Uh, and he does. And now we have a guy named Omri as king. Again, it's going to get very hard to keep track of all these names because as we can see, kingship is turning over very quickly in the north. So, when we're introduced to Omri uh, and his military coup, it sounds like everything goes very smoothly, but then we quickly see it was actually somewhat of a more complex endeavor. Uh, seems like the first military coup must have clearly did, with Zimri, did destabilize everything. Omni, Omri again, military coup, but this time less support from all of the army. Even the army and the military structure now is fracturing. And again, one high-ranking military leader thinks he can be king. Another one thinks he can be king. Why not more? Uh, now, to consolidate the power base, we've kind of set up the religious structure so that that doesn't interfere with claims to power in the north. But the military structure is now a big issue. Uh, you basically have anyone with the ability to summon a bunch of troops behind him uh, trying to claim being king and to kill his rival. Uh, and so you get a period of, I guess you'd call it civil war, uh, in the Northern Kingdom. Uh, although it's less clear that states are involved, and it's mostly just armies of generals hoping to, whoever has the army left when they're done, by virtue of having military power where there isn't any more, has is king uh, because as long as the army keeps listening to him, because nobody will want to say otherwise, uh, because then the army will show up. So it's really now we're seeing as a result of these military overthrows how someone comes to have power in the north is going to be fundamentally different from how they have power in the south. Again, in the South, there's this idea that it's a dynasty established by God and you're ruling by divine right. In the North, you are no, there's no interest in ruling, again, by the consent of the governed. It's going to be a rule of force. It's going to be a tyrannical rule uh, set up by power, by force, specifically military force. Uh, so whoever can control and command the military, that will be the basis of their power. Uh, and it wasn't that way, remember, when it started. All the people chose that they wanted someone not the southern king, Rehoboam, to rule them, and they chose Jeroboam. And he was given, he did briefly, uh, when he had his shot to set up something that God was going to condone, he did rule by the consent of the people and by God. But he turned that away from the God point of view, and now none of these guys is asking what the people think. Uh, in, in a military coup, you don't exactly hold an election. Um, so they're just taking it because it's there. And so again, we've shifted the power base and how it is that someone is king in the north. Uh, but as we're shifting the power base, then everybody who has a claim that way is going to throw their hat in the ring. Uh, so first there's Zimri, then there's Omri, uh, and uh, 
this competition here with Tibney, uh, and we'll see Omri wins. Uh, no more mil no more military commanders in a position to. They probably did some restructuring of the army to make sure nobody else had enough power to try to do that. Uh, but now, solid power base rooted in military strength instead of any of these other things that we were doing before. Um, with that, he sets up a new base of operations uh, and builds a new capital um, in Samaria. Uh, and uh, we see later the whole region ends up being named for this, which remains the capital of this region for a very long time. Uh, and it is ultimately called Samaria after the name of this city. Um, so, we're at least going to, now that this transfer of power has been completed, we're going to have a little bit more stability, um, which is not to say things are great, and certainly Omri is not improving things from God's point of view, but we do at least have a king who seems to have things set up now to have some grasp on the throne, and we're going to have more than a year or two or seven days with the same king. So, most of what we've had to say about Omri, uh, military coup, reconsolidated power from a military point of view, uh, and established uh, firm control over the kingdom, uh, and said like Jeroboam did. Uh, now we're going to get on to we actually see someone who has a child who comes to the throne, uh, and that is Ahab, who will be king for some time. Um, we have, again, we've act by setting up a political or a dynasty with its power base rooted in military. Uh, we're actually going to be able to have enough stability to guarantee I'm going to be able to pass the kingship on to my kid, uh, and he's going to be able to hold on to it. Um, at least for a little while here. Um, and he's bad too, and maybe more bad. Um, he's, so he is still complicit in carrying on the sins of Jeroboam, which we've seen is bad enough to get you killed, um, and no good at all. Uh, and then he adds that he marries a foreigner, uh, which in theory is really frowned upon, but basically every king of every kingdom has done. Um, whether it's been explicit or not, even, I mean, there's been, it has not been frowned upon, really. Um, even though, of course, the potential downside is if you marry a foreigner who worships different gods, then she's going to want to worship her gods, and, you know, she might want you to, uh, and Solomon, who was, by accounts, one of the wisest human beings to ever live, fell into that trap. Uh, and Ahab does too. Uh, and Jezebel turns out, his wife turns out to be a real piece of work. Um, and we'll see kind of how that goes. But it's not just that you know, she's, she has foreign re re religious practices and, you know, kind of would like her husband to go to church with her. Uh, this is... It involves a lot of things, uh, and she ends up, yeah, conflicting a lot with the religion, whatever it is, in the region. Um, bad deal, bad news, and this is going to last for a while, so we're going to get to kind of see how it plays out and what goes on. But this newfound stability is not necessarily a good thing for the people, that somebody manages to... Uh, Take over. A tyrant who abuses their power is a really bad thing. Um, and that is kind of where we're moving now for a bit here. So, in what is a refreshing change, we're actually going to spend several chapters digging into uh, a few of the same characters here. Uh, we have introduced Ahab and his wife Jezebel uh, as our antagonists in this particular story uh, and set up uh, kind of what, where they came from and some of their motivations and where they are. Now we're going to see, uh, I guess, entering the ring on God's side, 
um, we're going to see this guy, Elijah, uh, who is a well-known prophet. In fact, if uh, somebody could only name one prophet, they would probably name Elijah. Uh, we'll see why. He does some neat things. Um, and he shows up as the prophet does, kind of out of nowhere. Right? We've seen kings have to have this claim or base for their power. Uh, and it's not God in the north. Um, and so you don't just make a king and all of a sudden some guy's a king. You see it coming. It's either they inherited it or they were in a position where they could gather enough support uh, to overthrow the person who is the king. Um, but you don't need any of that to be a prophet. You just need God to call you uh, and then to do what he says. Um, and so a prophet can come from any place at any time. Um, and it is not important what a prophet was typically before being a prophet. Because um, they also seem to drop everything when they get the call uh, and dedicate their lives to just... And this is what makes Elijah potentially different from some of these other guys we've seen uh, who just show up, deliver a message, leave, and we never hear from them again. You know, those guys could be farmers or shepherds or cobblers or whatever, uh, and it's entirely possible that they deliver one message and go back and resume their lives. Um, what we see with the Marks Elijah as the first major one of these people we've seen since Samuel is that this is, once he's called, what he does. He is a prophet now. And everything that he does, his whole life, is now being a prophet. Um, starting with this first message. He comes out of nowhere, he goes to the king, he says, there's going to be a drought until I tell you that there's not. Uh, and then, because of course he believes his message, but also because now he is doing what God tells him, he skips town. Uh, if there's not going to be any rain and it's going to get kind of miserable, why would you want to be there? So he actually crosses over the Jordan. He leaves the Holy Land uh, and camps out where there is at least some water, uh, kind of suggesting that the very worst of these conditions are kind of isolated here in Israel, um, in the Promised Land. Uh, there, of course, were some people who settled the Transjordan tribes over on the other side, so it could still be within the kingdom. But that core area of the Promised Land is the core area here that is going to be hit by this drought. Uh, and this is... The, the characteristic of this message is not what we've seen. It's not explicit that, hey, you should all repent. And it's definitely not, I'm killing a bunch of people. Um, it's not entirely clear yet what the purpose of this is, uh, but it really is setting up Elijah's authority. If he can show up and say, yeah, rain stopped, um, and it's only on his word that it can start again, we're really setting up, this is a whole other thing. This isn't just any guy could have walked up and said, you're going to die, God told me to tell you that. Um, it takes something almost categorically different to establish your credibility to this extent. Uh, and this really fits criteria for how you might determine a prophet. He says a thing is going to happen, um, and then it does. And then he's predicted a second thing will happen. He can speak and make it rain again. So that even nature is... Uh, is adhering to his word. Uh, that is the word of God as it comes to Elijah. Uh, so if he needs to, it seems like this is mostly about establishing the power and credibility of Elijah as an instrument of God, um, which is not a thing we've seen, uh, which means we're doing something here that is not new. It is We've seen Elijah won't do something really fundamentally different than the other prophets did, but to make sure that everybody's paying attention, uh, we're going to make sure that there is enough evidence to take Elijah seriously and to really understand 
this isn't just some holy guy talking. This is something else. This is God talking through a person, which there's not a great deal of precedent for the people being able to understand. Um, it's one thing to have, and it's hard to, it can be hard to know the difference, right? It can be hard to know where is God speaking through someone and where is someone claiming to speak for God and maybe they don't know, uh, even in our world today. Uh, and it can look very similarly. Uh, but when God really wants to make sure that the people know, no, this is me speaking through a person, he really makes it extremely clear. Uh, back then, through Jesus and even now, uh, it can be pretty hard to doubt when we see this really acting. But at any rate, we get to see all this play out. Something very interesting is going on here with Elijah, and it'll be fun to see what comes of it. So, Elijah's been camping out in the wilderness, and ravens have bring, been bringing him food, and there's been a little stream thereabouts. Uh, but now, uh, it seems like and this is not uncommon when we follow God, that even in a place as relatively uncomfortable as that, he might not let us get, over, get any too comfortable. Uh, it's time to move on. Uh, and so he goes, uh, and he finds this widow who is not an Israelite, uh, in a land that is not Israel or Judah. Uh, here he is outside of what we would traditionally think of as God's area. All right, there is a geographical area at this point in human history that is pretty much designated as God's. And now there is a person that is pretty much designated as the instrument of God on earth. And he's leaving it, uh, which is extremely interesting anyway. Uh, and he's leaving it after saying bad things are going to happen to it until I come back and tell you not. And then he goes... And in the midst of, we see the drought and the famine has extended beyond uh, because this widow he finds is nearly out of food. Uh, and she and her son, they're pretty much, she's ready to give up. Uh, she's on the last of the food, doesn't know where she'll get more. That's the end. Uh, and we see Elijah come into the picture and we see something else about how God views these situations. So there's no rain and there's no grain, but or oil or they're out of their their supplies are essentially nothing at this point, and that is to Elijah not a concern whatsoever. Uh, he doesn't say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were almost out of food." Go at it, and I'll go. Yeah, you should eat, you should carry on with your plan, and I'll go make other arrangements. Uh, she says. I have no food. And he says, eh, just give me some anyway. Uh, and it is fine. Uh, there's this human thing that we deal with, scarcity, where there's a finite, finite amount of stuff, and when it runs out, it's out, and there isn't any more of it. That doesn't seem to apply to God. Uh, God doesn't need mounds of stuff to apply, to provide for people. He, it works differently. And Elijah being this man of God is not at all concerned by the fact that there's almost no food left. Uh, and says, eh, there's not none. We're fine. Uh, yeah, just make me some food and then make yourself some food and then carry on with your plan. Uh, but there's not no food left. So it seems, and I God does not provide for us necessarily by giving us great abundance, but by making what we have sufficient. Um, it's not, oh, you want to help the widow? Uh, I will make a giant mound of bread, and you can have this huge provision of food, and you can all, you know, shack up until the problem's gone, and you'll be good. It's, they're always on the verge of not having enough, and yet it always suffices. Um, but there is, in that scarcity, there is still abundance, uh, as much as if it were the other, and in fact, even more. 
but it looks like so little and ends up being more than it would have been if it had looked like a lot and been not God's magic bread. Uh, I know it's not quite that, but it kind of works like that. Uh, and the same can be true for us. Uh, when we want God to solve a problem of scarcity for us, how often do we think, I want a great abundance of specifically money comes to mind. Uh, that would be a great way to solve any of those problems. Uh, but here we see God's version of that is, I will make the very small, almost gone amount of money you have enough to provide for all of your needs over and over and over and over again. It'll always be the next thing you have to spend money on. You're going to be out of money. And yet, there's always money when you need it. Instead of, I have $5 million in my bank account and I've got this covered. Um, and the difference is extremely important for a number of reasons. The biggest one is, if you have the big pile, it's easy to stop relying on God. Whereas if you have just enough for right now, um, even if it's always going to be enough, it's always because of God. And you always have to keep relying on God. Um, you can never fool yourself into thinking that that abundance and that sufficiency is because of your own doing, or that you don't need God in it. Um, so, this is a neat story, uh, and it tells us something of how God looks at stuff, uh, and how he calls to us through our relationship with it, um, and calls us to reflect, I think, on our relationship with things. Um, where do we have an abundance versus where do we have a scarcity? And it's not only money, it's other things in our lives as well. Where have we thought, I would like God to give me, and an example I often use is a pony, because it's kind of fun, but it's, you know, standing for, this is the huge abundance of, this is what I want uh, from God. Uh, you know, God can give me a car without giving me a Ferrari, as an example. Uh, and it can serve the need that I have, and maybe not the want, but the need. Uh, the want is to have first security, but then beyond that, comfort uh, and, you know, sometimes status and other things, which he really doesn't care about at all. But he, with faith, he will provide for the need. Uh, he may not make it comfortable or certainly make it go every bit the way we want. Elijah lived in the birds, lived in the wilderness and ate what... Uh, Ravens brought him for a long time before this. He's used to having nothing and having God take care of it. But for this woman, she's still thinking of it not as God does, but as people do. And she's thinking, yeah, I'm about to starve to death. Uh, we have to learn to change our perspective of what do we expect from God and how do we expect it to work. It's not, I want a pony or I want, you know, this job, this spouse, this amount of money, this status, this address, this, all the things that we can easily start to think we want. Um, when we look at it in terms of the want instead of the need, we're missing where God is and where we're at now when we don't have those. We're missing, oh, look at what I do have, and isn't it amazing that that has lasted me and gotten me this far? And look, God has been feeding me the whole time as my jar is not yet emptied uh, and continues to. And here I am wishing I had this other thing instead of this thing that God has given me and wishing I could... It's really putting ourselves at odds with God's call for our lives when we do that. It's saying, God, the magic bread you're making for me isn't enough. I want some meat or whatever. It's saying, God, the life you have made for me and given me, that's not what I want. I want what I want. Um, and we've seen, we're seeing how that plays out in the north, which is potentially why Elijah has to be outside of Israel for this encounter. The people in the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom rep as a whole, represents that saying, but this is what I want. 
uh, and going after and doing that. Um, and so for Elijah to have this genuine encounter that is focused on God providing for a need instead of people seeking apart from God what they want, he goes outside of the Holy Land, outside of the region of God, uh, to people to and find someone who will be receptive. Will say, yeah, this works for me. You know, whenever this jar runs empty, I'm just gonna lay down and die. But until it does, I'm good. Uh, so yeah, if I can make food, and there's more food. Sure, let's keep going. Uh, and I'm really happy in that situation. Uh, and how often, yeah, do we say in our lives, well, I have enough to keep going right now. Uh, I have what I want in terms of what I need in all of those areas. I can keep going right now. So what else do I need? Um, the rest is on God. Instead of, but I'm going to go try to do all these other things I want. Um, so there's a strong call in here for us to look at. Uh, first of all, there's the textual situation of bad things happening in Israel. Elijah's not in town. Uh, pretty much drought everywhere. Uh, Elijah listening to the word of God. Uh, and we're learning also a call for all of us to look at the material and how we interact with it. So, Elijah and this widow are chilling. Uh, note, that's where the focus of the story is. It's not, oh, the people in the Holy Land are languishing and Judah and Israel are starving and things are so miserable and people are dying. We have totally shifted focus uh, the narrative has away from all of that onto just this very small place centered around Elijah. Because uh, that is what is at, in a book called Kings, here is a man who is more important than either of the kings or either of their kingdoms, uh, this prophet Elijah. Uh, and what's he doing? He's just hanging out with this woman uh, who has a new and legitimate complaint. Uh, her son has died. Uh, and she brings it up very interestingly, uh, she doesn't say that it's not a deserved thing uh, or that she has not sinned. She says, you have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance, as though now she being in the presence of this man of God somehow makes it a bigger deal that she has been a sinner. Uh, and through that encounter, then, here the prescribed punishment of death here it's coming because she's, God remembered, oh yeah, that woman should have died, or her son, because of her sins, and I see that because I'm with Elijah, and so we should do that, is kind of her point. Um, and that is and isn't right, right? The, that is the state of humanity before Jesus, is everyone is in a state of deserving death. So in the sense of, yes, I've sinned, and yes, Death is the consequence of sin. She's absolutely right. Um, she's not right. It's not like Elijah seeing that made God say, Oh yeah, I forgot to kill that kid. Uh, is not how that works. Um, and here we see, as we'll see the story progress, uh, what God is doing here is, uh, in the Gospel according to John, there is a man who is born blind. Uh, and one of the... Jesus, question, Jesus' disciples asked a question of him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Uh, and Jesus says, yeah, it's not about that at all. It's so that the glory of God might become apparent, might become visible. Uh, in a similar way, here we are establishing, God is establishing Elijah as not like anyone else we've ever seen. Uh, which, it should be enough that he stopped the rain at words from his mouth, uh, which is unusual to say the least. But now we're going to, where the rubber really hits the road with any of these things is life and death. Uh, and so now we're going to see something unprecedented uh, at this point in time. Uh, and yeah, we'll see, because we don't actually, we see that Elijah decides to intervene, but we don't actually see what happens in this question. Um, we probably all know already, but we'll save that. But Elijah doesn't say to the woman, yeah, you sinned, and oh yeah, sorry, I'm here, and God noticed that your son was still alive. Uh, he says, God, what gives? Uh, 
things aren't that great around, but this woman, this has been a fine situation. Uh, can we maybe, can we not do something about that? Uh, so God speaks through the prophets, but here is a prophet also speaking back to God uh, and entreating God on behalf of the people. It is, as a conduit, it is communication that can go both ways, uh, that can go from God to the people, but the prophet is also able to take the needs of the people to God. Uh, we saw it with Moses, who interceded for the people. God got so sick of him, he said, Moses, new plan. I'm going to just wipe out all of these people, and I'll continue the promise through you and your line, and we'll make a whole new people of God. Uh, these people are infuriating. And Moses said, you know, no, God, no, don't do that. The, they're, they're decent folks. Uh, give them a break. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get this figured out. Uh, yeah, this wasn't a good thing, but don't do that. No need to go to that extreme. Moses interceded for, for the people to God. So, and, it, and it's not the only place that it happened, but here it is an important thing to see about a prophet. Elijah being moved by this woman's situation is able to also speak to God on her behalf as God speaks through all of the people to all of the people through Elijah as well. What we probably most of us knew was coming and probably saw coming if uh, we didn't, uh, the boy comes back to life. Uh, again, this is unusual. Uh, it's worth thinking about why it's important, especially that it's unusual. The people of the Northern Kingdom have started turning from worshiping only the one God. Uh, this is, we tend to live in a monotheistic culture that generally we think when we think about worshiping God, there's only one option. You either do or you don't. Not, which God am I going to worship? But back then it was very much, there were lots of different deities who in theory had different roles, of course, as we know and believe, there actually is only one. But they thought there were a lot more. And they had different practices around different gods. Uh, and specifically those built up about things people needed from nature that they couldn't explain or control themselves. Uh, so it was extremely common to see things having to do with rain and drought and harvest and food, which is the situation we've been in now. Uh, where Elijah has called a drought. Uh, he could be the prophet of any number of gods and, in theory, do that. Uh, what we see happen here with the woman is in a different category. So it's not that she didn't believe Elijah when the jar kept having bread in it, kept, she kept having the ability to feed herself and to make food. It's just that that is not necessarily that unusual of a job description for any number of deities. Um, what is unprecedented for any other god is power over life and death. That's the thing that the god of Israel claims, uh, and he alone, um, and demonstrates it here uh, when someone who is dead comes back to life. That is only that one God can do that. Uh, and so it's not so unusual when the woman says, uh, now I know that you are a man of God. Uh, capital God, God, right? Yahweh. Uh, I know you're a, you are a man of this God, uh, the God. Uh, she could have thought he was a holy man connected with divine things before. But now it's just, there's just the one choice. Uh, he is a man of that God. Uh, so that is a big deal. Uh, and again, we see the other part of this that is a big deal is that God who has power over life and death listens to Elijah in how he exercises that power. This is very strongly foreshadowing Jesus Christ, uh, who is a man, uh, also God, who asks, 
who intercedes with God on the behalf of dead people, all of us, uh, and asks God to bring them back to life. Uh, and that is, so this is like on a scale of one boy, uh, and what Jesus did is on the scale of all of humanity. Um, but we see this lays precedent for that. Um, not that Jesus needed precedent for what he did, but we needed it. We needed the tools, the, the context to understand what's happening. Um, and this lays some of that context and sets a framework where we can understand that it is God working, that it is someone interceding for people to God, um, and not just God doing it. Now God, in Jesus, set up a situation where he comes, that he sends himself down to intercede for us. So, but it's still, for whatever reason, he has chosen to follow the framework like we see here uh, in how he brings about salvation for people. And we have the story to provide context for us to help us try to understand better what it is that Jesus um, has done for all of us. Um, and that is what we see in the prophets is we see a, a lesser degree of what it is that Jesus does as a representative and mouthpiece of God. And of course, Jesus being, is able to be more than a mouthpiece as God himself, but he takes this role to its conclusion, and as we see it being developed here, we see it pointing more and more toward being like Jesus. Um, so things are in chaos. There's no rain. There's famine. Elijah's out of town. Uh, we've got a king in the north who is a bad guy. We haven't heard much about the south for a while, but things are progressing as they were at the end of our previous lesson. Uh, pretty much the same there, and I'm sure nobody is loving the famine. Uh, but we're moving on, and we've got this prophet who has arisen. This has been an overview of Lesson 6 of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study. Thus says the Lord, God speaks through his servants, the prophets. For more information, consult our written study, and visit us online at turningtogodsword.com.